You've seen the film, now come into the real world and witness the making of Peter Jackson's Bad Taste. Continuing BBC Two's Forbidden Weekend. Movies are a medium in which you can get away with murder. You can, you can show um, anything you like. And, um, and it's safe and harmless and nobody gets hurt. And yet it can certainly shock or thrill a few people, which is also a bit of fun. Audiences worldwide are being shocked and delighted by the good, bad taste of this backyard New Zealand feature film, brainchild of the gentle 25-year-old Peter Jackson. Oh, I'm, um, I mean, I'm definitely not a violent person myself. I'd never want to, um, <laughs> never want to experience half the stuff that goes on in bad taste. And lost. But a film of this magnitude required a dedicated team unpaid crew and actors to slave weekends and after work for four years. Peter enlisted the help of workmates and old school friends. Craig Smith, working for the Department of Internal Affairs, became the victim. <laughs> Dean Laurie, a labourer in the gardens of the Wellington City Council, played a villain with a thirst for vengeance. Ken Hammond, a newspaper advertising consultant, died 23 times as an assortment of aliens in an assortment of disguises. Photolithographer and workmate Terry Potter, who ended up on the hero's team with more arms than he could handle. Pete O'Hearn, working with the Ministry of Transport as a records clerk, was also at school with Peter Jackson and was persuaded to take and receive the film's first blood. <laughs> and Mike Minette, another photolithographer from Peter's days when they all worked together on the same daily paper, completed the team of dedicated friends and amongst the heroes became leader of the pack. Very nice bunch of boys, yes. really very nice. It used to give me a lot of pleasure when they all trooped home here and um, we just had baked beans on toast. It was always, <laughs> Peter said to me one day, Mum, get some baked beans in. We'd always eat baked beans on toast. So I found myself buying a crate of baked beans and we still got some left. here yeah. left. So I look on them with great affection. I think they really, they belong to the boys. <laughs> Peter Jackson was born and raised on the coast just north of Wellington, where he attended the local primary school. An only child, he was fascinated by the purchase of a home movie camera and quickly overcame any shyness in front of the lens or behind it. Well, he took control of our camera as soon as we got it, our little first little movie camera, and he could make better use of it than what we could at his young age. We were like millimeter and... <laughs> He used to turn, we would only mm, film mm. people walking towards us or something like that, but Peter used to have other ideas and he would have them mm. swinging round and doing all sorts of things. They'd just got it for Christmas, somebody gave them a camera and um, I immediately grabbed it and managed to get a roll of film from somewhere. I was about eight years old and I got a bunch of my mates and we dug a big hole in the end of the garden and got a lot of World War II uniforms and ran around. Um, acting out something like out of a war comic full of action and high drama. His first special effect, sticking pinholes in the celluloid for gunshots. Special effects and action are at the heart of his filmmaking and were as much a part of this second World War II epic as they are of bad taste. And for Peter Jackson, it's always been a matter of doing it himself. This was the very first monster that I ever made. This little character here, he's like sort of a crazy hunchback rat. And I can't remember exactly when it was. Um, he's made of rolled up newspaper. I guess if we undid all that, we could find a date on it. This later monster was created for a film submitted for a local television competition, encouraging younger children in filmmaking. But at that stage, he won no prizes. 
the uh, valley is an attempt by me to really duplicate the Sinbad type of movies because they were done by an animator called Ray Harryhausen who used to have these amazing monsters and I really used to love that stuff when I was a kid. I should say special effects, that, that was his forte. I, a stop motion animation, as, you, as you've seen on some of the earlier sh shots, he was, he believed a lot in that. Yes, he was very clever doing mm. anything like that and, and had oodles of patience mm. that he would spend hours and hours mm. just making a model and then doing stop motion animation. Mm. I think the horror part of it came in because he saw that as the market that he could get into. Then along came James Bond, a new style for Peter to try as director and actor, impersonating his on-screen hero, Sean Connery, but already displaying his own innate sense of humor. But many of these early films were never completed. Yeah, losing interest was a major problem earlier on because I had, um, so many different different ideas that I'd sort of start shooting something and I wouldn't be particularly pleased with the results. I'd realise that I didn't have the money that I needed or the expertise and it was really, I was thinking of ideas that were Hollywood, big budget films and I had a little Super 8 camera with, that couldn't shoot sound and um, I was trying to do animation when I didn't have a single frame control. I just have to use a, press the trigger for a short burst and get two or three frames that was jerky and I'd be quite disappointed with the results and um, so forget about that particular little movie and move on to something else. But now, having left school and working as a trainee lithographer, Peter is able to meet some costs and aims for a new dimension. I had this idea of shooting a cinemascope film because I loved the shape of the cinemascope um, screen. So I sent over to England and got a little lens that you can put on the front of your camera and your projector and you can make movies in full cinemascope. So we um, worked for about a year on this vampire movie which never got finished again, although, you know, over an hour it was shot. And even seeing it now on the screen is quite amazing with the um, this huge letterbox-shaped cinemascope screen. It's quite an effective little film. In 1983, Peter buys a second-hand camera capable of professional results. The old 8mm is returned to mum and dad and work is begun at once on a 10-minute film which four years later will become the feature Bad Taste. 90% of Bad Taste was shot on a Bolex. They're very, very basic. You put the film in this side and then it's like a spring-loaded motor. You've got to wind it up and it gives you about 30 seconds worth of shooting. They're nice and light and you can do a lot of camera moves with them. I mean, you know, and it looks fine on the screen too. He had the camera and his friends to assist him. But camera gear had to be made by hand. Tracks, a dolly, and although requiring some effort in getting to locations, particularly cliff tops, a camera crane. So the whole thing was knocked together out of uh, aluminium and put together a bit like a giant Meccano set. And um, the camera, this little lightweight Bolex again, was just mounted onto this bit on the end here and of course um, because of all this bloody metal I couldn't look through the lens at all and um, all the crane shots were done by pointing the camera in the general direction of the actors and just hoping for the best but if you use a wide angle lens you usually get away with that sort of thing. But sometimes the camera must stay with the action. This is another bit of gear that I built for um, the film it's called a steady cam, and um, Normally, if you buy a proper one, they're about 40 or 50 grand, but this one cost a, a 20 bucks. And it sort of works basically the same principle where you can move the camera around, follow people while they're running, and get more or less steady shots because it's a spring-loaded thing. Move around like this. So it'll come up and down, in and out. And we use it for um, quite a few little shots in bad taste, and it seemed to help a little bit. The next big challenge was to come up with ideas for workable and cheap special effects to be used in the on-screen action. Well, 
Well, the idea with most special effects, I reckon, is to keep them as simple as possible. And if you've got to have a machete going to somebody's head, it's easier to have a real person's head in a fake machete. So you knock something together like this with um, a bit of cardboard and some ice cream sticks to keep the whole thing reasonably rigid. And there's a pipe for blood, the little holes here that comes out. It just fits nice and snugly like that. <coughs> And um, we use quite a few simple little props like that. There's another one here, actually, with a, a mallet that had to be whacked against somebody's head. So um, just made a block of sponge. You can whack it as hard as you like. Peter Jackson's ability to create realism at next to nothing cost also went into building an arsenal of weapons. Went a bit over the top because I did mechanisms that could work. All this sort of carry on. Uh, the magazines are just made of wood and a bit of cardboard on top. And um, I just got a whole lot of aluminium tubing like this bit here and uh, drilled holes in it. And it's really held together by glue. It's not particularly strong. If you drop, dropped it on the concrete, it would probably shatter. And this is just a bit of FIMO, which is like plasticine for the handle. And uh, we just had to have the guy shaking these guns and make it look as if they're shooting. We superimposed flashes on the front. To an industry used to multi-million dollar budgets, these achievements might well be sickening. And the film went on to create its own on-screen nausea. Well, in the middle of Bad Taste, there's a scene where um, a guy is incredibly sick for a long time. And there's a character that was played by me, but I had to make a rubber head so that we could get this stuff coming out the mouth um, endlessly. So the way that we did that was um, I got a, this bowl of a dental um, stuff called alginate, which they used to make molds of your teeth with. But I filled a great big bowl with it and the stuff sets in about a minute. So I took a deep breath and stuck my head in the bowl and then pulled it out again, gasping for breath after a minute. And I poured plaster of Paris in to get this effect here. I had to have this expression on my face the whole time. <laughs> and from this, I was able to make a plaster mold, negative mold. And uh, we ended up with this, which is um, the head, and it's a puppet. The mouth goes, uh, uh, uh. he's got a funnel in the back of his head, so that the stuff can be poured down, the green guns can be poured through the funnel out the mouth and... Uh, uh. Horror, science fiction and splatter. The audience couldn't be sold short. We had to see the aliens in their true colours. <laughs> this is the, the chief baddie in the film. He's made out of foam latex. Originally, you start off with a sculpture that's um, done out of plasticine. And the way that I sculpted this guy was I didn't have any sketches or designs because I never like working off of drawings or drawing drawings. I'd far prefer to work in three dimensions. So I just got this great lump of plasticine and started to sculpt. And um, after you've done the sculpture, you have to make a plaster of Paris mold. And in this case, it was in about five or six sections. And then that has to be filled with foam latex, which is like a creamy material that is whisked up in a cake mixer and poured into the moulds, injected into them, and then it's got to be baked in the oven. And um, I had to use Mum's oven for this, and it's only a normal household size. So this head was, the size of this head was determined by the, um, the size of the oven, and I managed to get it so that it could just squeeze in with about half an inch to spare, which is why he's got a, quite a flat top on his head. Um have a menu planned for the meal that night, you know, using the oven, and quite often we'd have to end up by having sausages or something under the grill because he'd want the oven for his baking. Mm. He used the oven a lot, and the whole kitchen actually used to take over to make his moulds. The latex moulds were laid over fibreglass, 
with wires to control the lips and give the appearance of speech. You three kill them. The rest of you can be... The major location for the film was set inside and outside an old colonial homestead. Protected as an historic building, it was necessary for Peter's father to persuade his friends, the caretakers, that no harm would be done by the unlikely team. I was worried at when they first came in. And they had smoke bombs in the trees, that sort of thing. In the middle of summer, you begin to think what's going to happen. We checked up after every time when they'd been here. And, yeah. now, all in all, I think they behaved themselves. <laughs> but what about the inside the house? No, they, if they touched anything, they always put it back again. There was no worries. We thought that it was just three or four occasions, I told Mrs. Steele. Yes, uh, not three or four years. It was 30 or 40 occasions we went to Gear House, I imagine, before we finished. The screenplay required that one corner of the building be destroyed by rocket fire. So a location was chosen with a matching background. And the team changed hats from actors and film crew to chippies and proceeded to build an exact replica five metres high. The corner to be demolished was designed to be broken away for a number of takes and reassembled to appear whole. Then came the first experiments with explosives. The missile was tested on a line. Two, one. The rocket was all right. The blast didn't do a great deal. <laughs> Three, two, one, fire. In the finished film, the rocket did indeed travel on a fishing line. But the house also had to fly. Another model was built, this time a metre square, and mounted on the camera crane instead of the camera, which remained fixed. The house was fitted with lights and smoke machines, and a country road was also built in model form for the foreground. But things took a while to get right. Sometimes there was too much smoke and the wind was wrong. Five meters, one meter, and now an even smaller model for the final scenes in space. It was actually made out of old um, film boxes that I used to get from the National Film Unit, cardboard boxes. And we had a light shining inside here, which provided the interior illumination. And this was sitting on a gramophone turntable. And we slowly spun it around. It's really lightweight. Bad Taste is Peter Jackson's 12th film. What began as a 10 minute short finished as a 90 minute feature. After four years of dedicated work and some professional help in putting the film together, Peter was convinced it could go commercial. It was to be screened publicly for the first time at the 1988 Cannes Film Festival. I told Peter, I said, now don't be too unhappy if it isn't a success at Cannes. I said, it's a, a heck of a lot to achieve and if it was, well, all to the good, but it may not be. Don't be upset by it. Uh, I was thinking, having put four years into something, nobody could be told it was a failure. A failure it was not, selling to ten countries in six days and winning the coveted Gore Award in Paris a few weeks later. And the team's response? It was really a surprise that we finished it, really, <laughs> more than anything. I sort of haven't paid much attention to it after that, although it sort of keeps cropping up, which is good. It's getting a lot bigger and bigger by the same. It's great that it's taken off like this, you know, and, and something we can be proud of. Achieved something, you know, and it's, it's so good that it's, it's gone over so well overseas. 
you know, you didn't really expect it. And, and it's quite sort of overwhelming to know that, you know, you're actually being watched in a different country. Happy. I'm quite happy. I'm really happy for Peter, because he deserves you know, everything that's humanity. To my mind, you know, if people pay $7 to see a really polished Stanley Kubrick production, then they're not going to want to spend $7 to see a really sort of rough as guts, bad taste. But uh, I was wrong. People are quite happy to do that. Pete started it, I think, and everyone chipped in, put their own ideas in. I think that's why it worked so well, because everyone just had so many ideas, and Pete had so many options to use. But Pete made it here. I didn't think it would be quite so gory as what it is. But then, as he said, there's a, a laugh with every drop of blood, Mum. There's laughs, so that... Uh, he's, he aimed at that. I mean, I know him very well, and uh, he's always got... A, he's always had a great sense of humour, and I think that that's his forte, is humour. But he's somehow... He's uh, covered it with horror, too. Mm. Black comedy. The film has won international acclaim for its humour and originality, for an extraordinary individual talent, which began in childhood. Being an only child does make you uh, more imaginative, I think, because you have to create um, your own games by yourself with whatever props come to hand. I mean, you know, matchbox toys and building blocks and that sort of carry on. You haven't got any, anybody else to bounce off, so you you're creating it all in your own head all the time. And it, I think it certainly helps sort of um, exercise the mind, if you like. It's trained your mind to, um, to think of things, to be imaginative. Bad Taste was made with great enthusiasm, but very little money. The world holds its breath for Peter Jackson's second feature, and first fully professional film. Look on in horror next on BBC Two. We're heading deep into the night with Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. Forbidden Weekend presents. The first film to be censored in Britain surprisingly didn't feature sex or violence. A piece of cheese took the starring role. The censors I've met in my life always look kinky to me. Today, 10% of films are cut before they reach the screen. The censor has a different perception. It's what turns him on 